coming up now, we've got Nicola. Nicola, uh, I didn't check how to uh, pronounce you. Nicola Rivaldo. Um, so, he's going to be talking to us about migrating Babel from CommonJS to ESM. So, he's been working on this project since he was in high school. And um, I think that this is going to be an absolutely amazing talk. So, could you please welcome to the stage, Nicola. Oh, hello, everybody. Uh, well, with so many talks about like new shiny features coming to Node, this is more a story about something that happened over the past three years. Uh, and like migration from CommonJS to SM. It's like ESM is eight years old now, uh, and still like the Node ecosystem is struggling with this. So let's like see what we did for migrating our own code. Uh, I, well, I'm in Team Babel. I am one of the three core team members in the work at Egalia. If you want to know anything more about that, just like come talk to me. Uh, so this is a story uh, that started long ago. Once upon a time, there was like this library that happens to be Babel, but this is just like a detail. And it was written, uh, authored as ESM, but like it was not real ESM. We're just compiling to CommonJS as like most of the NPM packages written in ESM actually do. Uh, and like everything was going fine until one day we started getting this. And like this is like a common shared experience in, in open source JavaScript projects. Uh, it's not what motivated us to migrate. Like it's fun to see that this all started already in 2018. Uh, and at some point, a core team member of Babel decided like to actually do this for various reasons, such as uh, dependencies upgrading uh, to SM and also like just wanting to use the, like the, the new module system. Uh, and so this talk starts there. Uh, it's the item chapter, chapter one, introduction. What is Babel? Uh, usually all my talks about Babel start with Babel is a JavaScript compiler, but like it doesn't matter at all here. Uh, Babel is a development time tool, uh, so you don't usually bundle Babel, you don't ship it to the browser, you just run it through like some build process. Uh, it's configurable, so many Babel users will write a JavaScript file uh, configuring how it works, and at runtime Babel will load this file. And it's pluggable. So other than configs, we have to dynamically load plugins, depending on what's the final the config file. Uh, it's usually embedded in other tools. People don't directly uh, interact with Babel, but like they run it through rollup or like through some, through some meta framework. Uh, and finally, Babel is a JavaScript library. Uh, it has a JavaScript API, even if people don't usually directly interact with it. And all of these uh, answers to the question, what is Babel, affected how we migrated to, to ESM. Uh, as many of us know, ESM comes with some challenges. Uh, the most obvious one is that it cannot be synchronously imported from CommonJS. Uh, you cannot use import in CommonJS. If you try to require an ESM file, it throws. Uh, you can use dynamic import, but it returns a promise. So like, it's different from how require works. Uh, and like, as a consequence, you cannot import ESM synchronously, uh, dynamically, uh, like not at bootstrap time. So you cannot load files before knowing their path, for example. Uh, also, ESM compiled to CommonJS has diff works differently from native ESM uh, in Node.js. Uh, like, if you ever try to just import the default value of a library that was ESM compiled, you probably saw this object with like a default property or like an ES module 2 property, and it's not really how it behaves uh, when interfacing between compiled files or between native files. And lastly, ESM doesn't really integrate with tools that virtualize require that implement custom loading. Uh, for CommonJS, uh, this is like it's been worked on, but right now I believe, uh, and like mocking on the flat translation and bad things that some JavaScript tools do that like you should try to not do by yourself. Uh, and lastly, uh, before starting migration, we had to decide how we're gonna migrate, and we had this concept of what's internal code for us, what's external code. So. Uh, what, which parts of the migration will affect the most people and which will be more dangerous, which will be more beneficial. Uh, we have Babel source that's like written just by a bunch of people and it's used by like every single Babel users. Uh, and we have Babel tests that are written just by a very small number of people and used by a very small number of people. Uh, so that's internal code. And then externally, as I mentioned before, we had configuration file plugins uh, that are written and used by different amounts of people. Uh, and External code was initially our focus because in 2019, oh, this is already four years ago, it felt 
class, uh, not unflagged the ESM implementation. And we didn't want to hold back our users from using uh, ESM in their code. So we need to make sure that like, be able to support interacting with external uh, native ExmaScript modules. Uh, and like, we started getting some feature requests for, for doing so. Uh, so how do we do this? Uh, well, this brings us to chapter two, making Babel asynchronous. Uh, so this is not related to SM, just a sync await. A sync await is like, it's very viral. Uh, you try to use it someplace and it spreads everywhere. So this is a like, very short summary of Babel's internal code, uh, where we have a transform function to transform, to compile some code, and all the way deep in the call, st in the, in your call stack, there is a require call that loads your config file. Uh, or a plugin. So what happens if you try to use dynamic import there? Well, to load an ESM file. You have to use a wait, and your function becomes a sync, so then you have to use a wait to call your function, and suddenly, like, the sync await virus spreads everywhere. Uh, and, like, that was not great. We wanted to preserve backwards compatibility. Uh, and, like, only people that were using ESM needed this async, this async version of the API. Could we preserve the sync API for everybody else? Uh, well, like the easy way is to just duplicate everything. You have the sync version that just does require, and you have the async version that supports also dynamic import. Like that's terrible. You have to maintain two things that are basically the same. Uh, and like we, a former Babel team member uh, came up with a solution for this. Uh, they wrote a library called GenSync that lets you basically abstract whether your code is running synchronously or asynchronously. So instead of using an async function, uh, like, like in this example, you can use this library that's based on generators. It's very similar to maybe some of you like remember Co or other libraries from before that we had a sync await. You basically wrap your generator uh, with this library and then you can write it either synchronously or asynchronously. Uh, so you write your code once and then the library takes care of making it run in both ways. And you can like for the, for the exit points, you can define whether like what's the sync behavior, what's the async behavior. Uh, you can have utilities, but like most of your code is written just once and you need just to define at the, like, at the IO points how async and sync differ. Uh, so we rewrote our code to this and like we had just a single implementation capable of running both ways. Uh, and then we could like export the old sync API, export the new async API while preserving exactly the whole behavior. Uh, and like this led us in 2020, uh, so that's, well, also almost four years ago, uh, to support MJS config files, and then one year later we added support for MJS plugins and presets. Uh, so at that point, Babel was uh, able to externally interface with native ES modules, and like we were not holding our users back anymore. Uh, but then we started thinking, okay, what do we do with our, with our own code? Uh, how difficult will it be for us to migrate? Uh, we didn't want to start experimenting with the, with the published code because we like, migrating to SM is a breaking change. And like, we wanted to make sure that things were working before exposing them to our users. So we decided to start with tests. And that initially went terribly. Uh, as I mentioned before, ESM uh, compiled to CommonJS behaves differently from native ESM in Node, and our test runner just didn't support ESM, uh, as Tali mentioned also yesterday morning, so thanks for introducing this. Uh, so, okay, let's analyze these two problems. Uh, how many of you have ever seen this ES module variable in your code? Okay, uh, a bunch of you, great. Uh, why do we need that? Uh, when compiling some ESM code to CommonJS, like the, the obvious way is to just add the exported values to our properties of the exports uh, CommonJS object. Uh, and when you require a module, you just read the properties from, uh, from the result of require. Uh, and there is a caveat, which is that default is not, like default is just another name export that happens to be named default. Uh, so like in this example at the bottom, you have to read the default property from there. Uh, and this is so that it works both with named and default exports. Uh, but then like what happens if the file we're importing is not ESM compiled to CommonJS, so where the value is on the default export, but it's a module just written manually in CommonJS? Well, in that case, you would just assign the default export to modules that exports. Nobody manually writes export the default equals the function. And so then your ESM compiled to CommonJS that is important in this module doesn't have to read the default property anymore. Uh, it just has to call the exported value. 
So there is this difference when importing a module, depending on whether the module that you are importing, not your own file, is being written as the SM compiled or as native CommonJS. Uh, so how, how do transpilers and bundlers solve this problem? Uh, well, when you're importing a CommonJS, like a manually written CommonJS file, they've wrapped it in an object defining a default property in it. Uh, and like, how do we know uh, when we have to wrap it, uh, when we just have to give you the object? Like, for example, Babel has this interop require default function. Every tool has something similar. They basically check, is this uh, result uh, from require originally as model that's been compiled to CommonJS? If it is, uh, then just return the object. Otherwise, wrap it in, a def in, like, in an object with a default property. And in order to, to perform this, like, was an ESModel model check, tools emit this experts dot underscore underscore model property. Uh, and then like this, like the interop function can just check, can just check if this property exists. Uh, and like this has been around for very long. Uh, it was first introduced in 2014, uh, and like, and it then spread to every single tool, uh, except for one, Node.js. Uh, in Node, like you would always get this object, and there is no way for you to like get the default. Uh, the default value of the ESM module very important that was compiled to CommonJS. Uh, so, like, if you have two native ESM models, it works. If you compile both of them, it still works. Uh, but, like, then as soon as you start interacting between a compiled module and a not compiled module, uh, in our case, because we're only not compiling the tests, uh, but, like, the much more common case would be that you are writing your library, your app in ESM, and you are, and you are importing from some NPM package a file that's been compiled to CommonJS, uh, it breaks. Uh, so in your ESM code, you have to add the default property, but then like, if you then decide to compile your code uh, because maybe you want to publish dual packages or you want to make sure that your code both, like you want to add to ESM with node semantics, but then you still want to publish it transpiled, then it breaks because you have two default properties. Uh, so what we did was like to add support to multiple tools for the node behavior. We first had it in Babel, then we had it in Rollup, and like multiple tools now have options to ignore that ESM module property and just do whatever node does. So problem one was solved, uh, maybe not in the other way, but we, it let us have tools behave like the built-in behavior. And then it came problem two. Uh, so Jest also had a support request in 2017 to add support for ESM. Uh, and Bunch of years later, the managed maintainer decided to actually start working on it. Uh, so why does just have problems? Well, it uses some low-level Node APIs, uh, specifically the VM module, uh, and it abstracts how files are loaded, how modules are executed, how they are linked together with their dependencies uh, to provide like some features and some sort of isolation. Except that uh, VM, the VM module doesn't really support ESM well yet. Uh, like there were crashes, there were many crashes, there were other like problems, uh, there were crashes at the V8 level, uh, and like some of these issues have been fixed, not all of them are, uh, like for example this V8 uh, bug, I think it's still open, even though it was reported three years ago. Uh, so we just couldn't use the SM with Jest. Uh, what we did uh, was to basically rip out of Jest all that virtualization it does, uh, and like just use the Jest, like, rely on the Jest like, interface, on the good DX that Jest gives, but like still running taste, taste, uh, tests in bare node without all that like, additional stuff. And so we, originally this was a script in our own monorepo uh, to just like, run tests more easily. Uh, then Pretty also wanted to use it, so we published a separate package. If you're using Jest, if you want to use SM, go check this out because it's great. Uh, like we just, Started use, when we started using the package, we saw that our tests like, got much faster because like, we were just doing much less work uh, and like, the, the time needed to run the test went down by more than 50%. And so we solved problem two. Uh, we didn't really solve the problem by having just work well with SAM. We just solved the problem by just avoiding the problem altogether and just keeping the good part of just and not like the, the whole test runner. Uh, so we solved our problems, and our tests were finally written in SEM. So we, I was finally, for the first time, in a real project using real ESM code without having to compile it. And like, that was great. Because, uh, for example, it means we didn't need to compile at all our tests anymore. We could just run them. Uh, 
So, like, it took a while to migrate our test, but it ended up going well. So we were thinking, okay, now we know how to do this. How do we actually get ready to release ESM code uh, to expose our ESM code to our users? Uh, well, some packages uh, in the NPM ecosystem started publishing dual packages. Uh, you basically have your package as ESM, you compile it to CommonJS, you publish both versions, and depending on how your users use your package, they can, like, they will either load the ESM or the CommonJS version. And using those packages, like, creating those packages is hard, and it's very easy to accidentally introduce breaking changes. Uh, we, we tried doing that. Uh, we have a package Babel runtime that's used, well, at runtime, not at dev time, so we wanted to ship it as ESM so that people could more easily use it in browsers. And we, we converted this, uh, like we had to analyze many different cases, like how, what happens if I import from ESM in this tool, if I use like CommonJS in the other tool, and we did it without, without breaking changes. Well, uh, except that a few hours later releasing that, we had to release a patch uh, because we broke Gatsby, and then we had to release another patch, and then another one, uh, and like another one, because we're loading the wrong version, and then another one, and another one, and another one, and one more. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and it worked at the end. It's now published as a build package, and people have not been reporting back anymore. Uh, but like every single node version, every single Webpack version, Rap version, we're just doing things differently. Uh, so we decided we're not going to do the same with all the other packages that we have. For context, the Babel monorepo has around 150 packages uh, because we have the core packages and then a ton of plugins to support various JavaScript features. So we decided, no, we're going to wait until the next major release. Uh, however, we still, like, we like DSM. We want to use DSM. So we decided to do something we call dual development. We we start in developing locally without compiling our files down to CommonJS. And our code base it used, uh, is always able to run either compiling to CommonJS or without compiling. Uh, we, like, by aligning uh, our behavior with the built-in behavior mean, means that like, we didn't need to have differences anymore. Uh, we test both the SM version and the SM compiled to CommonJS version, and so we're always ready to publish an SM release. Like, we just have to, to pass an M flag to our build script. Uh, okay, uh, but like, so we were developing SM and we found a problem. Uh, that is, well, we know migrating to SM is a breaking change, but we didn't really want it to be a breaking change. We wanted the transition our users to be smooth. So we realized that before releasing it, we needed to somehow uh, protect our users from the breaking changes introduced by migrating to SM. Uh, so how do we do it? Uh, well, there are two main Babel usages. Uh, there are users that use the Babel API uh, directly. They like require Babel, but that's a very like little fraction of our users. Uh, and then there are users that use Babel plugins. Uh, not many users write plugins, uh, but like all of them use them. Uh, so we wanted to preserve backward compatibility with all plugins. And like you see, for example, they might require Babel Core, and we didn't want to break them. Uh, so, so instead of just we didn't want to publish the packages. That's like complex, and we prefer to just like move all the way. But we decided to publish something that we called proxies, uh, but like some common just models that just basically re-export the SM API. Uh, like, how can that work since common just cannot import SM? Uh, well, there still must be an asynchronous step somewhere. Uh, but like, due to how Babel is used, that somewhere is very often hidden to the user. Uh, so for Babel consumers that require Babel directly and then call one of these transform APIs, well, you can still require Babel, you can call transform async, and that gives us an opportunity to run the async step to import Babel. So if you, call, if you require Babel, you run transform async, you can set like transform async in the common just version, first imports Babel and then runs it. Uh, obviously this cannot work with the synchronous version because it's not like loaded yet, but it means for all of code that in Babel 7, written as CommonJS, is requiring it and using the async API, things will just keep working without having to force our users to migrate to SM. Uh, for Babel plugins, we are lucky here. Uh, for Babel plugins, also the sync API can still work. You can still require Babel and use it synchronously. Because the way plugins work is that first somebody loads Babel. Uh, then Babel reads the config file, loads all the plugins, and then the plugins require Babel once they've been loaded. But like Babel was already loaded. Babel was 
load it before loading the plugin. So is there a way we can synchronously access it? Uh, well, what happens is that the SM version of Babel will like inject itself in the common JS proxy so that when you require the common JS proxy, all of Babel is already exposed there. Uh, and this like made it possible for us to preserve our, our sync APIs in the common JS entry point, uh, even though it's under the hood implemented as CSM. And so we were ready. Uh, we were like production ready almost. Uh, we like it was time to actually expose this to our users. Uh, and we finally released Babel 8 alpha zero uh, just a couple of months ago. Uh, and again, it feels like just yesterday. Like, I can really believe it was like four months ago. Uh, like it was the first release of Babel 8 and it was released using native ESM. And it doesn't contain any common JS code except for this very tiny proxies. Uh, and like fun fact, somehow the change log doesn't mention this. I don't know how, how it's possible it was missed. Uh, well, maybe it's great because again, the idea is that this change should not be a breaking change for our users. Uh, should be just like an implementation detail. Uh, okay, so we released it. Uh, we, our tests were all passing, but like, does it really work? Uh, well, Babel itself is compiled, so it's a good project to test changes to Babel. We can like dog food our own tool. Uh, it's actually very fun how we use Babel itself to build Babel, because the problem is that before Babel is built, there is no Babel, so you cannot really use Babel to build Babel. And like, it's, it's, kind of complex, but it ended up working. Uh, so time to dog food our tool. Uh, this is my dog that wanted my food. Uh, do you want to say a little bit more? <laughs> uh, yeah. So like, it was time for us to actually start building Babel using Babel 8 rather than building Babel using Babel 7. So we updated all the Babel dependencies in our package JSON. And the only change we had to do was to remove one option from one of, from one of the presets, presets we were using, uh, just because it was enabled by default. Uh, but like moving from common JS to SM for us didn't cause any, like, any other problem. Uh, so actually there is like some asterisk there because uh, we always make sure that we're also able to build Babel using Babel 7. So our config file has to be written in a way that works both ways. So if you ever check the pull request, they're a little bit more complex because we're checking like which version of Babel we are using. Uh, but like it's basically just enabling and disabling some option completely unrelated to these emulated changes. And that's it. Uh, it's on NPM. Uh, if you're a Babel user, you can already try using the SM version. It's not stable yet. We're still planning some breaking changes. Hopefully, it will come soon. Uh, I say soon, but for Babel 7, it took us two years to go from alpha zero to stable. So I don't really know what soon will mean in this context. And go ship some SM. Uh, go convert your libraries, and let's try to push this forward. And thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Nicola. Um, we we actually do have time for a few questions. Yeah, I have one more thing. Oh. Uh, so, as many other tools in our ecosystem, Babel is just an open source project. And like, it's not a like, company sponsored open source project. We didn't, like, we just didn't want to do that. So, Babel is free and it's all sustained by donations. So, if you're using Babel at work, talk with your company. If you need help with that, like, come talk with me first and like get your company to sponsor us because we are like three maintainers working on this. And well, in order to maintain a project this big and to like guarantee some level of stability, we need funding to make sure that we can pay our core team members. And that's the end for real. <laughs> you really fooled me with the false ending there. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, does anybody have any questions? No? How many of you are using native ESM? Oh, that's like 5%. Great. <laughs> awesome. Well, let's see again, like two years where we will be. Brilliant. Well, you've, you've clearly answered everything. Um, thanks very much for the talk. And um, you are from uh, one of our sponsors as well, aren't you? You've got. Uh, yeah, Igalia. Uh, Igalia. We're actually giving three talks. If you want, we like are a consultancy working on many open source projects. Uh, so if like you have 
any needs with like work on Node, work on browsers, standards, so come talk to us if you need anything related to that. Brilliant. Thank you ever so much.